This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Next on Up Next. We're actually more disapproving of adultery today than people were through most of the past, particularly of male adultery. For thousands of years, you were expected to just suck it up if you were a woman and take it as long as he didn't humiliate you too bad. Welcome to Up Next. I'm Eric Berkowitz, and on this edition, we consider the future of marriage and families with Stephanie Kuntz. Ms. Kuntz is a professor of history and family studies at Evergreen College in Washington. She also serves as co-chair of the Council on, Co on Contemporary Families and has published many books on the subject, including Marriage, A History, The Way We Really Are, Coming to Terms with America's Changing Families, and The Social Origins of Family Life. Professor Kuntz has also authored a series of provocative op-ed pieces in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many other prominent publications. Today, we turn to the delicate art of predicting how marriage and family life will develop in the years and decades to come. Welcome, Professor Kuntz. Thank you. I just want to start, before we go into the future, let's step back just a little bit and talk about why we get married and foreign families at all, what the use of it all is. Ten years ago, you wrote that marriage is the highest expression of commitment in our culture and that a happily married two-parent family provides an optimal in environment for the raising of children. But the stats over the last decade or two show a very steep decline in, in marriages and a sharp rise in alternate living arrangements, single parents, gay couples, etc. And about 40% of Americans recently said that marriage was obsolete. Singles, in fact, now make up more than half of the American adult pop population. Given the rapid changes that are going on right now, do you think maybe it's time to rethink what you wrote? Well, actually, there's no contradiction between seeing marriage, people seeing marriage as the highest expression of commitment they can imagine as a relationship and them thinking that maybe as an institution it's obsolete. And that's a very mm, important distinction. For thousands of years, marriage was an extremely powerful institution precisely because it wasn't a very good relationship. Marriage was something that you had to do in order to have social respectability. Women had to marry in order to find support by men. Once married, they had to defer to men. Marriage was also about obedience. You married to get good, advantageous in-laws. And love really had very little to do with it for thousands of years. Uh, that meant you could have a very strong institution of marriage with lots of penalties for not joining that institution. But the relationship was secondary. What has changed in our society is that we no longer think it's essential for people to get married. We no longer rush them into marriage uh, at an early age. We allow them to leave a marriage. Those things weaken the institution of marriage. They make marriage as an institution that organizes our lives obsolete, perhaps. But here in 2015, what is the emotional value of marriage? What is the, why do we get married? What is the purpose of marriage? There's a tremendous paradox involved in what the satisfactions and the benefits of marriage are. We have increasingly begun to demand of marriage something that no people in history ever demanded before the last 50 years. Not only that it be based on free choice, but that it be based on equality that it be based on individual negotiation, that it be based upon voluntary compliance to the standards of marriage. Never before in history have people had that kind of choice. It means that when people do succeed at making their marriage work, it works better than any couple of the past could ever have dared to dream. Are you saying that we demand more of a successful marriage? We absolutely do. We, we uh, you know, even 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, People would say, well, we have a good enough marriage. He hardly ever hits me. Or my wife, you know, she's such a good mom. She doesn't understand my work. I can't talk to her about that. Or the woman would say, you know, well, I can't 
you know, the guy doesn't know much about how the kids or my feelings, but he's such a good provider. Today, that doesn't, that cut, doesn't it. cut it anymore. You cannot marry a gender stereotype. You have to marry a real individual, and we expect that marriage to grow and not just to, to, to shrivel on the vine. That yeah. means marriage takes more work than it ever did before in history. One of the things that you wrote is that it wasn't until the late 18th century, that's the time of the French revolutions, the American Revolution, et cetera, that the, quote, radical idea took hold that love should be the key element of marriage and that people should be able to choose their partners on the basis of personal affection. More provocatively, you wrote that as soon as love took center stage in marriage and companionship became the main goal, observers warned that the same thing that increased people's satisfaction in marriage as a relationship undermined the stability of marriage as an institution. Now, that's 225, 235 years ago. Those who, contradictions. Who were those observers? And is love a destabilizer of marriage? Love is definitely a destabilizer of marriage. Uh, it's also, we have decided, a very important component of marriage. And therefore, to have a successful marriage, you have to love each other, and you have to be able to work on that love. Um, and you have to but, stay loving one another. And you have to stay loving one another. And you have to grow with each other so that you can uh, change that love. You know, when the ideal of the radical idea of marrying for love was first invented, people were terrified because they says, well, that will make people say, I won't get married, even if they're pregnant, if they don't love each other. And sure. they'll demand the right to divorce. But, and so it was a very destabilizing idea. Every place the development of love as the basis of marriage has come, the demands for divorce have risen and the demands uh, for legitimation of singlehood. But so can we say that, that love is a poison pill to marriage, essentially? No, but love is a huge challenge to marriage. And you've got to make the love work. For 150 years, we destabilized the love match by saying, defining love in terms of mutual need for, from one person for something they could not get for themselves. So the man, you were supposed to fall in love with your opposite. The man was supposed to fall in love with the woman because the woman could give him access to emotion. She could take care of the home. She could feed him. She could take care of the children in ways he never could. Uh, and the woman was supposed to love the man because he could take care of her economically in ways she never could. They were supposed to fall in love with everything that was, that was not present in themselves, that was strange. And the result was, it stabilized marriage, but in ways that were ultimately quite unsatisfying because you had to fall in love with a stranger. It's only in the last 40 years that we've asked you to fall in love with a friend. Let's talk about adultery, which is a very interesting subject because that was traditionally a ground for divorce. She's having an affair, the marriage is broken, the vow is broken, I want out. I think uh, you know, that's no longer the case. One doesn't need to build a case against the other for adultery. But the question is, is it still toxic to marriages? If you discover that your husband has been doing something you didn't know he was doing, wouldn't you agree that still we have this urge, for lack of a better word, to own our partner, to own our partner's sexual availability. Well, let me put this a different way, because this surprises most people. We're actually more disapproving of adultery today than people were through most of the past, particularly of male adultery. For thousands of years, you were expected to just suck it up if you were a woman and take it, as long as he didn't humiliate you too bad. As late as 1930, uh, the constant wife created quite a stir, because the woman did not uh, Accede to her family's and friends' uh, uh, demands that she actually just shut her eyes to her husband's affair. We're more disapproving of adultery today than we were in the past. We're more That's, disapproving of male adultery. Yes, and well, and of adultery in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's partly because we understand that marriage is a relationship that is more voluntary and that you can leave if you want to be untrue. Now, that said, let me say that there are big cultural variations in how important 
uh, adultery is to people's notion of what is a marriage. And uh, it may be that there are some marriages for which it's not toxic if it's openly discussed and openly um, uh, agreed upon. But I think, yes, for most American marriages, it is toxic. It's recoverable from uh, with the proper kinds of interactions. But it is something that uh, sets many couples on a very bad downward spiral. I'm an attorney by training. And I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this. One of the key elements in any marriage contract, be it a Jewish marriage contract or the contract entered on the altar, is a vow of fidelity. Since a cohabitation, since people simply moving in together and sharing rent, et cetera, doesn't have that open, clear statement, I'm going to be true to you. I will not be making love with anyone but you. You'll know who your children are. I'll know who my children are. Wouldn't you agree that that vow still has value? Yes, but many cohabiting couples make that vow. Many people long before they marry, and in fact they don't marry until they're clear that it's going to be kept, mm. decide that they're going to have point. an exclusive relationship. Now, I just read something interesting. There are some couples who are now writing up contracts among themselves by which both sides agree to be faithful to one another. There is one case from about eight or nine years ago in particular in which the man had an affair. The woman was very upset about it. She only allowed him back in the house. If he wrote a contract with her, which a lawyer drew up saying, we're not going to make love with anyone else. And if you do, husband, you're going to lose the house. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he strayed, and she sued him. She sued her husband, which was something that happened in church courts for thousands of yes, years, yes. something that happened in civil courts for thousands of years. It would never happen in court, court now, but she sued him, and she lost. She lost because the judge said, what you're doing, ma'am, is you are trying to add a fault aspect to divorce that the law doesn't allow. And I thought that was interesting because it struck me that this couple were trying in their own way to mend their problems. Shouldn't we be able to make those kinds of enforceable fidelity agreements with one another, even in states like California or Washington where you can get divorced for any reason? Shouldn't couples be able to make their own terms? When I talk to uh, people who talk about prenuptial agreements, I say, fine, if you want to make a prenuptial agreement about money, fine, but why don't you add how you will behave in the event that you have a divorce? Why don't you add to it the emotional parts of it? Now, that's not going to keep them from bad-mouthing each other, telling secrets to the kids, or all these things that we know are so destructive and the main reason that divorce is harmful and to kids. And people that we respect do it, and we cannot believe it happens. But at, <laughs> least, at least thinking it through might be useful to people. What strikes me about these kinds of agreements and why I'm dwelling on them is they seem like efforts that people are making to replace the rigid social conventions that were used in days gone by to hold marriages together, even during periods of stress. Now, I've been married for 28 years, and my marriage has gone through periods of stress. But we had a sense that it was worth it, and that it was worth it to work on whatever issues came up. It strikes me that when people, maybe through elaborate prenups, maybe through a woman getting a vow from a man, you won't stray from me anymore. And if you do, it's going to cost you. That People are now in the 21st century trying in their own way to bring back the rigid social conventions that held troubled marriages together in the past. Is, do you see that? Well, yes, of course. I mean, we are aware that marriage is a more voluntary institution, and we want to walk this fine line between making it voluntary enough so that we don't end up being oppressed in our relationship, but involuntary enough, or at least... Um, pressured enough so that you'll try your best to do something. And we are in uncharted territory where every couple is trying to figure this out for themselves. And I think that all that we can do as a society is help people develop the kind of values that suggest to them that you have integrity in your relationship with others, whether you have a marriage license or not. So we've been talking a lot about marriage. Now I want to go into the broader family con context because there's always children. 
And I don't need to spew out a lot of facts here. Everybody knows that the number of sole parent households has gone up enormously. 5% of kids were born to unwed women in 1960. Recently, it's reached 41%, 42%. Uh, there are gay parents uh, going adopting. There are all kinds of alternate groups coming up. People are forming co-parenting agreements, et cetera. That leads me to ask you, what is a family? What is a fa how can we define it? Not how was a family defined in centuries past. I think we all have a sense of that. But how can a family be defined in the decades to come? Well, I think that every society has a different definition of family, and those definitions evolve over time. You know, people say traditional marriage, one man, one woman. Well, actually, most traditionally approved marriage was one man, many women. Uh, but there are many, many varieties throughout history. So as we define for ourselves what we want a family to be, I think people are, many people are moving in the direction of um, defining it by its functions, and by the goods and benefits that it gives to its members rather than by biological uh, criteria or even legal criteria. And I think so that's the, so a So a family in the coming 50 years, the family of 2050 can be defined as? Well, I don't think this, I don't have any hard and fast definition. But as researchers, we know that when you look at individuals' well-being and the well-being of children, the most important thing is the processes that are going on in the relationships in which that child is embedded, the functions that it serves, not the legal structure. In the United States, if you donate sperm, you can do it anonymously, and you'll get a small amount of money, and there's an agreement that the agency won't reveal your name, et cetera. In Europe, it's not like that, particularly in France. There, the anonymity is almost non-existent. But there's now a phenomenon, given the decades of children being produced with that, of children now grown-ups looking for their half-brothers and sisters, searching for their genetic complements. And there are agencies who are helping them. And there's one agency who does that, asserts that, quote, we all have a fundamental right to information about our Bi biological origins and identities. And that agency will, for a fee, help you find that. I thought that was interesting. One, because people still feel this urge, despite the science, to find a genetically similar person. And two, do we have a, some kind of right to know who donated the sperm that helped to create us? How do you weigh in on that? Uh, I'd like to weigh out of that. <laughs> That's a very it's, it's a very complicated question that I think has to do um, that I would not want to put down one fa hard and fast rule for. One thing that we certainly know from research is that social ties trump biology, uh, and not In everybody. This case, it seems the opposite. Well, but that's the point. Not everybody um, wants to search for their biological. Uh, forebears. Uh, when people do, how much of that is because of the way that we've idealized this kind of family? How much do they need to know? Now, they may need to know just for their own genetic heritage. We know that's important. I think that's one of the problems with anonymous sperm donors. You don't know what kinds of possible uh, <laughs> relatives might even meet in, in the future. Precisely. I mean, if a man generates a child, he's going to ultimately if he can be found, be required to provide some support for that child. If a man donates sperm anonymously for 50 bucks, he won't be. And that strikes me as a paradox that works to the detriment of the child, emotionally and perhaps even economically. Well, the, the I mean. The law forces fathers to, and I think for good reason, own up to their fatherhood of children, mm -hmm. produced through sex. Yes. But not the case produced through artificial insemination. Well, and of course, um, it would be very, it would be impossible for 
uh, two lesbians uh, who wanted very much to have a child and are very invested in them to get somebody to be a sperm donor if they knew he was if he knew that he would have to then be responsible for the support of that child. So I think there is a uh, I think there should be some legal options for people to opt out of that particular kind of support in a sperm donor. Now making it anonymous is kind of different because then you get into all of these questions of the genetic heritage and who's related to whom. And I remember reading about one man who donated so much sperm that you could have brothers and sisters, half brothers and sisters marrying each other. So it is very complicated. We've got to come up with some ways of thinking about it. But there's no way we're going to turn the clock back. Let's turn that around a bit. A man donates sperm and then decides that it's his child and wants visitation and wants to know his child. And, uh, and how he says, you are my son. You are my daughter. Now, on a traditional level, that's true. But if we redefine families, perhaps that offspring is not his son or daughter. Well, yes, and this is one it's of the problems. It's a very difficult this, issue. You yeah. get this problem with step families, too, because mm, most in most legal cases, the step parent who ha may have raised that kid for many, many years has no right in the case of a separation to visitation and also... He's a stranger to the yeah, child. and no yeah. obligation to support, which to me is crazy because it is your re prior relationship with the child, not your genetic uh, quality that seems to me to count more. You know, couples are also producing uh, zygotes, or excuse me, gametes that they freeze. Are those brothers and sisters? How do we, how do we approach this? Are there any historical precedents for us to deal with all these difficult issues? I don't think there's any real historical precedent for how to deal with these issues. The historical precedent is that we can deal with these. There are so many different ways that societies have figured out or have managed to raise healthy kids and to uh, help people be obligated. Uh, for example, in um, Hawaii, where I sometimes uh, live, the, you they have this notion of a Hanai child. You give a child of yours to someone who doesn't have one, maybe a relative, maybe a friend. That Hanai child, you're not abandoning that child. You are offering one of the most valuable things you can to someone else. And they have a very interesting saying that they'll, they'll think about, instead of like the stepchild idea, that the ideal would be treat that child like he was a Hanai child. Oh my god, so that's because an ideal. Because so precious. <laughs> And you go okay. to the Bari of Venezuela, and they have the belief that every man who sleeps with a woman during her pregnancy contributes something to that child. That was also common in Sparta as well, many, many years ago. Yeah. But in Bari, a, the men take that seriously. They contribute a certain amount of their uh, fish catch and their hunting catch to the child that they, quote, helped father. And a child with a so-called promiscuous mother in yeah. our perspective. Is, is providing better Actual, for her child. Is actually, that child is uh, more than, almost twice as likely to live uh, to age 15 because he's getting more parental support. <laughs> well, I guess there's one thing we can agree on is we simply don't know whether those kinds of things are going to come or not. We, we absolutely have no clue. But one thing that we do know, and this is one of the subjects that I wanted to go into in some depth, is the question of, of poverty and, and wealth, class differences when it comes to marriage. All the research, including the research that I've read that you've called for, tell us now that educated, financially very secure couples, their marriages are lasting longer. They're, the women are waiting longer to get married. They're waiting a lot longer to have children. And when they do get married, there's, they still have at least an even chance of the marriage lasting and the children being well cared for. Whereas on the lower end of the economic spectrum, it's very different. In 1950, if I was a young woman um, without a high school degree or even with a high school degree, I could marry just about any man who came along who was in my neighborhood, and he would be a better bet for me than trying to uh, go it alone. Um, That's not the case anymore. That is not the case anymore. Uh, yes, two incomes would certainly be better than one, which is why low-income couples tend to move in together much more rapidly 
than the college educated who can afford to wait to do a good match, <laughs> you know, to search for a good match. So these couples, they move in together very quickly. But they're also well aware of something that policymakers seem to be not so well aware of, and that is that real wages and job security for high school educated men, or even men with some college, have just been plummeting. And so it's much more risky to hitch yourself to a man if you're a low-income woman. A woman named Tammy Nelson wrote recently that in marriage in the future will be defined by shorter renewable contracts in five-year increments or in two-year increments with options to renew, like a lease, that people should be able to check in with one another every, periodically, short periods, two, three, four, five years, and decide, is this working? Should we stay? How does that sound to you? I don't think it sounds very realistic in terms of most people accepting it. Most people really believe that they want to make a commitment uh, to the end. And um, I mean, is there something to be said for making a vow to one another to have and to hold, to love for 10 years? And well, then we'll see. But, but who knows? <laughs> Rather that, than till death do us part. Yes, but who knows whether 10 years is going to be the critical point. What you really need to make a vow to do, and I think this is what flows from all these changes in marriage that we've been talking about, you have to understand that never before has marriage been so voluntary, and never before have we wanted marriage to be something we both grow in together rather than that one follows the other and adapts to them for the rest of their life. That means you have to be prepared to renegotiate it every time something in your life changes. We need to be talking about this right from the beginning. One of the things about till death do us part, which is interesting, is that death is a much more distant event for us these days. It was easier to get married till, till the end when the end was 20 years hence. Yeah. <laughs> if the end is 60 years hence, times change. So you're saying let's not go towards renewable leases, let's renegotiate and, and work on this daily. <laughs> yeah, not a living will, but a living marriage. <laughs> yes. So there's, you know, the last question, with so much pulling against marriage from so many angles, for the majority of the, of the American and let's say the European populations, particularly the majority of people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, there aren't that many rich people, okay? With so many people migrating away from marriage, why stick to marriage as the paradigm, as the key family structure at all? Well, you know, I think... There's I, no more point for it, is there? Well, I think that we have 200 years of this romanticization of marriage simultaneously with this romanticization and eroticization of, of, of strangers, which creates a tremendous tension, and that somehow we have to thread our way between, first of all, making friendship sexy instead of making uh, ignorance and anxiety sexy, and then decide how we want to, to what our model for a relationship is. I don't think most Americans are going to give up marriage as the highest expression of commitment. But as a society... Is that just a habit? That, that's partly a habit. It's partly an aspiration, you know, okay. that you say to yourself, I know that a lot of marriages end in divorce. I know that I'm prepared myself to walk out of this if, if it's really bad. But I'm going to make this vow because maybe it'll help me keep it. In that sense, I can see why people cling to marriage. But there are people who are moving beyond it. There are cohabitors who've lived together for 20 years, 40 years, and have raised kids. We as a society have to respect commitments when they are made, obligations, even if they're not written out, that people have uh, taken on. And we have to find support systems that don't demonize people because they don't fall into the, you know, one particular model. Professor Kuntz, it has been delightful talking with you today. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.